friends, uh, on, on behalf of the World Council of Churches and the Norwegian Church Aid, uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you all uh, to this uh, webinar, which is to mark the World Toilet Day, which is today on the 19th of November. And we have a very interesting topic, is toilet a taboo subject for the church? Uh, well, before talking about uh, this uh, uh, webinar a bit more in a couple of uh, minutes, I would like to also welcome you all the participants, but also all the speakers. And uh, currently I, uh, Dinesh Asuna, I coordinate the program of World Council of Churches, which is the Ecumenical Water Network. And uh, this is the Water Justice Ministry of the World Council of Churches. And it is supported and uh, uh, coordinated with a number of specialized ministries and uh, regional ecumenical organizations around the world. The World Council of Churches, as you would know, is a fellowship of 350 churches from around the world, uh, comprising about 590 million uh, membership with all of you put together. And the EWN came into being in 2006 at the Porto Alegre Assembly in Brazil. Uh, currently, I'm also serving at the PAD Partnership uh, on Religion and Development um, as a co-chair for the working group or the work stream on water, climate, and environment. Uh, friends, so once again, welcome to you all. Uh, let me continue to give you a little brief about the uh, today's event. As we know that since 2013, the United Nations uh, recognized the World Toilet Day, even though the World Toilet Day has been there for quite some time, the observance of it. And uh, uh, well, today we know that about 3.6 billion people around the world, that's almost half the world's population who are living in without an access to adequate sanitation. Uh, and until last year, this 3.6 figure stood at about 4.3 billion. So there is some progress, which is good. Uh, so why World Toilet Day? Because it is to take action to tackle the global sanitation crisis and achieve the SDG number six, which is water and sanitation for all. Uh, access to hygienic sanitation drastically improves the dignity, health, and well-being of the person particularly women and girls, as they are the one who suffer the most, that face the brunt of this and not accessing sanitation services. It not only undermines the dignity, but also affects the safety and security. We'll come to uh, discuss in detail about that. And uh, this year, the World Water Day on 22nd of March, the theme was valuing water. And in the same uh, breath, now we have World Toilet Day, and the theme is valuing toilets. Uh, the, the, the campaign draws attention to the fact that toilets and sanitation system that supports them are mostly underfunded and poorly managed, and therefore the poorest in all different parts of the world suffer the most. Uh, so we may ask who cares about the toilets? Well, half of the world's population care about toilets. Maybe you and I do not think about it as much. And many people might uh, find uh, a bit offended when you ask them about the discussion around toilets. Uh, so when it comes to the church to talk about the toilet, sometimes some people may hesitate. But when it comes to whether the church should talk about human rights, dignity, health, gender justice, equality, racism, casteism, we have no problem the churches are addressing these issues, but having or rather not having an adequate sanitation affects these aspects of life. And therefore churches must talk about uh, these issues that affects around adequate and dignified sanitation, which in turn has so many benefits that we will today see. So I don't want to take much of our time. We will have various perspectives around this topic, uh, different people and speakers that have uh, come, a distinguished panel of speakers are around us today to talk about this perspective. So without further ado, I would request Marcelo to kindly put uh, on the screen the uh, speakers uh, that we have. Um, 
Okay, and uh, to, to, we have uh, today, uh, unfortunately, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur of Human Right to uh, Water and Sanitation could not be joining us in, in live because he's on a country visit to uh, Mexico, but he has been kindly sent as a video message uh, on to speak about the human rights aspect of uh, sanitation and Pedro Arroyo Agudo is the special rapporteur, as I just mentioned. He took responsibility in September 2020 when he started his mandate on 1st of November 2020. And uh, he has been a distinguished uh, member of parliament in Spain, where he is originally from. And he has been awarded the Goldman Environment Prize for his contribution on water uh, ecosystem and also on human rights to water. He has. Uh, uh, written uh, over kind of hundreds of articles and uh, over 70 books where he has contributed. He speaks English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. And therefore, this video message is also available in other languages if you wish to uh, tune in in your own language. So I request Marcelo to play the uh, video for us, please. Dear friends, in our daily lives, human beings not only need to ingest water and food, but uh, we also need uh, to urinate, defecate, and attend uh, to menstrual hygiene for women and girls in adequate conditions. Well, although talking about these uh, vital needs is often embarrassing uh, from our habits and cultural norms, they are still vital uh, daily needs. Therefore, just as safe drinking water is considered a human right, so too uh, the availability of private and safe uh, facilities for relieving oneself uh, is what we call, in what we call uh, uh, the toilet, uh, is covered by the human right to sanitation. The lack of a simple and adequate toilet in the domestic sphere uh, means defecating in the open air in often unsanitary conditions, without privacy, and even on the risks of insecurity, especially for women and girls who can and do suffer assault and rape as they have to seek uh, isolated spaces uh, to relieve themselves. But this human right to sanitation must uh, uh, include not only adequate toilet facilities in the domestic environment, but also the treatment and sanitation of the returns to nature, so that aquifers and rivers are not polluted, ensuring both the good health and sustainability of aquatic ecosystems and the health of those who need to be supplied with drinking water downstream. Regarding the Sustainable Development Goal number six, we are halfway of the deadline we gave ourselves for the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation to be guaranteed for all. And unfortunately, our efforts are not even a quarter of what we should have done. That is why uh, we need to step up the pace. It is often argued that uh, there is a lack of public funds uh, to meet this vital global commitment in what is called the financial gap. Uh, which is supposed to open up space to private financial capital to enter into the provision, into the provision of these essential services as business opportunity, you know. The, uh, but today this, this argument, from my point of view, it is not acceptable. Firstly, because it cannot be effective in guaranteeing safe drinking water to the billions of impoverished people who do not have access to these human rights precisely because they live in extreme poverty. On the other hand, this is not 2008, when the so-called austerity strategies uh, were imposed on us uh, by devoting most of the available public funds uh, to save from, ban from uh, bankruptcy. Uh, the very banks that uh, had produced uh, the crisis. Today, fortunately, the situation and the strategy adopted in the face of the pandemic and also uh, facing the economic crisis 
we are suffering are completely, uh, completely different. Significant public funds are now available, not only to tackle the pandemic, but also uh, for the post-pandemic socioeconomic recovery in what is called uh, the Green New Deal of the 21st century. The key is to definitively assume the need to invest a significant part uh, of these public funds in strengthening public health systems and in particular water and sanitation services as the cornerstone of public health. This is a democratic challenge and not a business opportunity. Finally, if we really want to accelerate the pace as UN Water has, uh, has been promoting, uh, we must reflect on which actors and social sectors are most interested in the fulfillment of, the, of these human rights. From a point of view, of you, uh, well, it is undoubtedly women and girls who are most interested in the effective fulfillment of these human rights. And not only because they are the ones uh, who uh, suffer disproportionately the consequences of their non-fulfillment, but also because they are uh, the ones who, in fact, uh, assume the greatest commitments to try to meet the water and sanitation needs for their, of their families in the most impoverished communities. Thank you very much. So that was uh, Professor Pedro Arroyo Agudo, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on uh, Human Right to Water and Sanitation, uh, sent this video message to us. And he obviously underlined there is now enough public funding still available, and yet uh, not enough is being done. And how uh, the, the, the lack of sanitation disproportionately affects the women and girls that uh, he overemphasized. Uh, friends, uh, as before we go to the next speaker, I would also request Marcelo to pull up the list of speakers that we have, as I already start uh, acknowledging the presence of these speakers. Uh, maybe uh, uh, as I am reading them, we, after uh, listening to Professor Pedro, we have uh, Professor uh, Isabel Apaupiri, the Deputy General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, who would be giving us uh, the church's perspective on dignity. We would have a thorough introduction for each of these speakers before they speak. We also have the presence of the Secretary General of the Norwegian Church Aid, uh, Dagfinn uh, Heilbreton. I hope I pronounced that name correct. Uh, we also have uh, Bezvera Wilson. I think he has not yet joined, or maybe I'm not sure if he joined later on from India, from the abolition of manual scavenging movement in India. We also mm -hmm. have my colleague, uh, Reverend Nicole Aswood, the program executive for a just community of women and men at the WCC to speak about the gender perspective. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, Michelle uh, Roberts, uh, from from the uh, Michelle Roberts from the Environmental Justice uh, Alliance to speak about uh, the Health Alliance to speak about the racism perspective where she comes from the United States of America. We also then have uh, messages from the chairperson of the WCC Ecumenical Water Network, uh, Bishop Arnold Temple. Uh, we also then have Rabbi Sotendorp. Uh, who would bring an interfaith perspective to this. So we have a very distinguished panel of speakers. So now without further ado, I would now, uh, uh, I, while I'm speaking, I request Marcelo to pull up the introduction of the speakers. Uh, and I request the General Secretary of the Norwegian Church, uh, and pardon me, I would bring, bring in Professor Isabel Apaupiri, uh, the Deputy General Secretary of the WCC. Uh, let me take a few moments to introduce her, please. Uh, Professor Dr. Isabel Apaw-Firi. Uh, well, she is a Malawian uh, teacher. She's a professor, so of course a teacher and a theologian uh, who has been the Deputy General Secretary of the World Council of Churches since 2012. And uh, under, under her leadership, we have the Public Witness and Diaconia uh, Program of the World Council of Churches, where she so supervises various uh, areas of work, including racism, sexuality, climate change, water justice, etc. And uh, obviously, therefore, she also is my boss. Uh, 
uh, as the ecumenical water network also comes under her leadership. Uh, she is regarded as the mother of the circle of concerned African women theologians in Malawi, where she originally comes from. So in order to bring in a perspective, a church's perspective on dignity, I would invite Isabel kindly, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dinesh. Right, uh, since I joined the World Council of Churches in 2012, Every year around this time, we gather at the Ecumenical Center Chapel to commemorate the World Toilet Day. Thanks to my colleagues at the Ecumenical Water Network who take leadership on this day. I have observed that many raise eyebrows. Some may be curious and some simply chuckle at the very thought of commemorating this day in our prayers. I remember a few years ago, while dedicating the morning worship at the Ecumenical Center to commemorate the UN World Toilet Day, my colleague Dinesh Suna and others had highlighted some imageries associated with sanitation, such as toilet papers, buckets and mags in the chapel. It drew some criticism from participants and colleagues because we associate the chapel with the holiness of the presence of God. And we always associate toilets with something dirty. We therefore cannot comprehend using these imageries in a formal conversation, let alone in our prayers. My colleagues apologized to others for hurting their sentiments, but emphasized that they were only trying to make a strong case about the churches to start take, talking about toilets in the context of the biblical passage where Jesus Christ said, I have come that they may all have life in fullness. Since then, we look for other ways of raising issues of sanitation or toilets in a way more profound but acceptable ways. This webinar is of course an attempt in that direction. Experience has shown us that in all religions, it is easy to talk about water and spirituality. In some Christian, in the Christian Holy Bible, there are more than 70 references to water, much more than the word Christ, love, faith, or even sin. However, there is no mention of the word toilet as we understand it or sanitation. Um, but there are some references to it. For example, let's take Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 to 14. It, it reads like this. Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And then when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement excrement. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy so that he, he will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. End of quote. So the instruction here, it was to the Israelites it was to tell them to use toilets to relieve themselves and not just practice open defecation. And that's about it. Also comes with the caution of profanity associated with it, that God would be offended and turn away from people who practice open defecation, or in other words, do not have access to a toilet. And as you have heard you know, from my colleague 
uh, Dinesh, the latest statistics you know, say that 3.6 billion people or about half of the world's population do not have access to a safe managed sanitation system or a toilet and close to 700 million people practice open defecation. So are these people forsaken by God? They may be poor, but certainly not God forsaken. From the Nazareth Manifesto, as we read it in Luke chapter four, this is 16 to 21. Jesus claims that he, he was anointed to bring good news to the poor, the captives and the oppressed. These are the people who comprise of the above statistics who do not have any access to a toilet. So tomorrow, 20 November, we will be celebrating the Children's Day. When thousands of children are dying every day due to lack of adequate sanitation facilities, we can no longer shy away from talking about toilets. When lack of sanitation robs people of their dignity, particularly women and girl children, it needs our serious attention. Fullness of life promised by God in John 10 verse 10 cannot be achieved without access to a dignified and adequate sanitation facility. You and I cannot imagine ourselves living in a world without it. Why should half of the world's population do so? It's high time we break the taboos associated with sanitation, toilets, and openly talk about it and pray about it. The theme of the World Day, World Toilet Day 2021, as we have also heard, is valuing toilets. For the sake of the billions, of people whose human rights, dignity, health, gender justice, equality, racism, casteism, education are, are compromised due to lack of dignified and healthy sanitation facilities or a toilet. Churches cannot and must not remain silent. I remember the Ecumenical Water Network of the WCC requested the prominent songwriter, Caroline Gillett from the US to compose a church hymn on sanitation. I'm told we will sing that song later today. Please kindly pay attention to the words of this song. And I want to conclude by quoting from a WCC document entitled, Together Towards Life, mission and evangelism in a changing landscape. It says, I quote, we affirm that the purpose of God's mission is fullness of life. And this is the criterion for discernment in mission. Therefore, we are called to discern the spirit of God wherever there is life in its fullness particularly in terms of the liberation of the oppressed peoples, the healing and the reconciliation of broken communities and the restoration of the whole creation. We are challenged to appreciate the life affirming spirits present in different cultures and to be in solidarity with all those who are involved in the mission of, of affirming and preserving life. We also discern and confront evil spirits wherever forces of death and negation of life are experienced, end of quote. So I end by saying that he, um, every person having a toilet is an affirmation of life as Christ intended it to be. I thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, you reminded us about the delicate moment in the chapel we have had a couple of years ago in the WCC here, uh, and also making a very strong case um, why church uh, must uh, start uh, or rather strengthen its addressing the, the, the issue on sanitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be some questions coming up during the discussion. Uh, now uh, we should move on to the next uh, speaker. And we have uh, in our midst the Secretary General of the Norwegian Church Aid, who is a co-organizer here on, of this webinar. Uh, we have uh, Doug Finn, uh, Ohio Breton, the Secretary General of NCA, uh, who is in this role since April 2019. Uh, he has a broad background from the Norwegian political life and from the international organizations. He has been the Minister of Health and Care Services, Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, Party Leader of the Christian Democratic Party, and Vice President of the Norwegian Parliament. He has also been the Chair of the Gavi Vaccine Alliance and is the special envoy of uh, Gavi uh, Pro Bono. In fact, Gavi is just next door here. Uh, I could see the building from here. Uh, in his public service, he has, among other positions, been the Director General of Norway Social Security Administration. He came to NCA, the Norwegian Church Aid, from the position of Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. So friends, we have a very accomplished uh, leader, both a political leader and a civil society and a faith-based organization leader here in our midst, and we are very proud that you have joined us and for your kind information, Norwegian Church Aid is one of the founding members of the Ecumenical Water Network of World Council of Churches. And he would bring in an ecumenical response as a specialized ministry of uh, WCC or ACT Alliance. Over to you, Dakten. Thank you so much, uh, Dinesh, and, and thank you to the Deputy Secretary General of uh, the World Council of Churches for this uh, strong uh, case for for uh, the church and the churches in this area. Um, I will uh, speak on a related consequence of the lack of access to toilets and uh, to uh, good sanitation in the world. Uh, and I will start by quoting the words of a 15 year old girl in Nigeria. She says, when I have my period, I don't go to school. There are no facilities to help girls manage their periods there. I will rather stay home until my period is over because if I get stained, I can never go back to school again. This is one of many stories where women and girls are excluded from society because of the major lack of access to safe toilets, sanitary pads and hygiene services. Women and girls are extra vulnerable when they don't have access to a safe toilet especially during their period. Menstruation is a part of life. It's a natural process that happens every month for the vast majority of women and girls in the world. Without menstruation, we humans wouldn't exist. Nevertheless, this is really a taboo that hinders a dignified life for many women and girls. Human dignity is central. It's at the core for the church. Norwegian Church Aid is part of the global church and our endeavors is a part of the global church's endeavors to promote global justice. We draw support from the fellowship of the ecumenical movement, manifesting God's love in the world by upholding human dignity and protecting the integrity of creation. And in our work around in more than 30 countries around the world, we have met girls that couldn't change their sanitary pads for several days, risking getting infections. In emergencies, some don't get access to crucial aid as they cannot move around freely during their period. Lack of access to safe toilets also make girls more vulnerable to abuse and gender-based violence. In Malawi, sanitary pads uh, have a very high cost. For many women and girls, lack of safe toilets hygiene services and sanitary products during their period means that they can not go to work, fetch water, cook, practice their faith, or go to school. Uh, we heard the figures, 3.6 billion people lacked safely managed sanitation services. 1.7 billion people still don't have access to a safe toilet 
and 490 million of them don't have a toilet at all. 367 million school children have no toilets at all in their schools and emerging data show in many countries a significant proportion of women and girls do not have the services they need for menstrual health, according to UNICEF. So access to safe toilets and menstrual hygiene management is fundamental to education, to economy, to health, to human rights. It's crucial to uphold human dignity. So it should be at the core of um, uh, the church's engagement for human justice. Let me um, say it straightforward. Most people on the world scene in powerful position are still men. And um, women seldom talk about menstruation. Many do not talk openly about this. And the issues of women and girls uh, get when they don't have access to a safe toilet. And when men in power do not address this issue, it's often not prioritized. It's often not even on the agenda. So men do not have menstruation, but men can speak about menstruation and the lack of safe toilets. And I think it's important that we do. Taboos and stigma around this topic is a big hurdle, both in terms of getting attention and funding to deal with the issues and for women to be able to manage their menstruation without shame. So how can we together be a part of a great change for these girls and break the taboos around it? On a grassroots level, can faith leaders talk about it in their churches, in their congregations? On other levels, can we take action by engaging policymakers, put it on the agenda and be a part of a positive change for millions of women and girls? We believe that together, we have a great potential to make a change for women and girls by breaking this, these taboos and put issues around the major lack of toilets and in this case, menstrual health management on the agenda. We believe that religious leaders can be champions and change makers for women and girls' dignity all around the world. We have seen it, and we hope to see more of it. Started with a quote, I'm ending with one, uh, or maybe a couple, uh, this time from Pakistan and Ethiopia. The menstrual hygiene kits has helped me accomplish my daily routines without shame. It has also helped me with my confidence. My hygiene has improved and I'm managing my period properly, says Nurto Muhammad Adan from Ethiopia. And uh, from Pakistan, a quote, before we had to wait until it was dark. We felt ashamed when we had to go behind the bushes. After our village got toilets, we feel comfortable and we do not have to wait until it's dark. We feel safe, said Burmat from Pakistan. The toilets were built from the telephone fundraiser that we had in Norway a few years ago. So I believe that uh, uh, we as churches together are in the position to be change makers in this area and and my challenge goes especially to church leaders and especially to those of us church leaders who are men to take this responsibility seriously. It's about human dignity at the core of what scripture teaches us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very powerful message, Duckman. And uh, as uh, you, towards the end, mentioned uh, about the telethon, the, one of the largest uh, campaign to address wash-related issues in, in may, may not be only in Norway, but probably around the world where you managed to raise nearly 36 million US dollars uh, to address these uh, issues related to water and sanitation uh, in, in about 10 countries a few years ago. And we are very proud of uh, NCA's uh, work. And you not only brought in the whole issue of uh, 
getting a dignified place for defecation, but uh, brought in the issue of uh, menstrual hygiene, so important for women and girls who are deprived of, of, of these. Thank you so much for your uh, powerful uh, testimony. And uh, friends, uh, now before we move on to the next uh, speaker, I'm also encouraging you all to put in, in the chat your questions or clarifications that you may have, which uh, we will collect uh, towards the end and uh, respond to them during the question and answer sessions. Thank you so much, Doug Finn. And now we move on to the next speaker from India. And we have uh, with us Mr. Bezwada Wilson, uh, who is an Indian activist and one of the founders uh, and the national conveners of the Safai Karmachari Andulan, or uh, the English version would be the Century Workers uh, Movement, an Indian human rights organization, and that has been campaigning for the eradication of manual scavenging. Uh, on 27th July 2016, he was honored with the Magsese Award, uh, which is a very prestigious award for the civil society, as we know. Uh, he's also engaged in the Dalit empowerment and liberation movements. He would bring in the perspective of the sanitary workers, because we have been talking about people, those who do not have access to sanitation. But there is another side of the story of the sanitary workers' uh, challenges. Uh, over to you, Bezwada Wilson, and thank you very much for joining us from India. Thank you, thank you so much. And this is an, a great opportunity. And I feel that uh, this is the time we must talk about the, actually the water and sanitation. And uh, because today is day of the whole toilet day and uh, we discuss about this uh, in many walks of the world. But later we don't take much serious about the issue because the toilet is a very completely the uh, issue which is in a not in our priority or agenda at all. So sometimes if the events made all of us to think about at least the time. And I represent actually not a toilet and I am not going to talk about the toilets and I'm going to talk about actually the people who cleans the toilet. Why they are cleaning the toilets? Is there any reason for the people to clean the toilet? It is not like a Western countries where the janitors coming and cleaning our flush out water closet and going. There are the people in India, there are the dilatrics where the human beings has to go and collect the fecal matters and they have to put it into the baskets and take it into the dumping bags. This is a very inhuman practice which has prohibited in India in 1993. But the practice of the manual scavenging, still it is existing and it is a continuing in many parts of the country. Even now there is around, uh, we think that almost like an estimation, uh, 160,000 odd, the women are engaged in cleaning human excreta in the country. Despite of the banning and despite of the many movements, still the, why the human beings are cleaning and particularly only the untouchable community is engaged or forced to clean the human excreta in the country. Among them, 90%, the women are cleaning where there is in a very less wages. It is in a like half a dollar per a month the people are getting. So there, the women are the 90%. So it is an issue of the patriarchy and it is in a well clear uh, uh, example for the practice of the untouchability. And there are the people, particularly the Dalits in the country, we were denied to draw the water in the main places. That is a very common here. The second is we do are not having proper sanitation facilities in the places where, where we live. I also come from the same community. My parents were there scavengers and my family were involved in the same this thing. So we know how. So this is in a very a kind of in a tricky position. We do go and clean whole country and the whole society and from morning till evening. But the same facility is completely denied to all of us. In one way, they deny the facility to us and they ask us to clean for everybody. 
So this is continuing. At the same time, the government is also come with many campaigns and many programs, but they will not touch the either liberation or rehabilitation of the women scavengers. They don't talk about that. They don't even think about modernize the sanitation system at all. We do develop in all sectors, but sanitation sector, they do think that even now, there are the people who will clean. Why should we invest the money on that? This is an, a very stark reality after practicing untouchability. And moreover, Indian parliament, the minister comes and announces that there are nobody is cleaning the human experience. And the women, they're coming out and they want to tell that I am still cleaning and I have a right to get my rehabilitation there. They are sending the police people and terrorizing them, stating that if you are telling that you are cleaning and you will be punished with the imprisonment and you have to go to the jail. But actually the 1993 and the 2013 new act both says very clearly, the person who engages the scavenger must go to the jail. But instead of telling that and executing the law, the government officers are there going to the scavengers and they're asking this. And the children of the scavengers do face a stigma in the school. When we go to the school, including myself, there the people call us with the caste name. And we are unable to raise voice and say that if everybody's students are saying, my mother is doing this work, my father is doing this work. So I have to get up and must say that my mother is cleaning the human excreta in that time. That is a very shameful. So for that sake, we don't feel to go to the school in the proper way. And much more, and another important thing is where there is a requirement is the modernized and the mechanized way of the cleaning, like the sewage and the septic tank cleaning, where there are not any mechanization. The result is there are the people after 2014, we went to the court in 93, 2014, we got the judgment. Later, we started counting the people who lost their life or died in the sewage and septic tank. We got the data about around 2,000 people. So far, we have a data by name that the people died in the sewage and septic tank. But no prime minister, no chief minister will be talking about the life of and dignity of this community. And we do count and we come and submit. Now they are saying that, no, this is not so big number and the numbers are very less. So they are denying the actual the fact of the people who are dying. And uh, uh, one is a denying, another is a human rights violation. And third important thing is their children's education they are trying to put into them the schools, but the government support is so less. So in all spectrum, in all areas, the government purposely denying the rights of the, our community, and they are not making any kind of efforts to actually bring back to the mainstream society and make the toilet facilities to the everybody is in a right. So this is an a, where it was not just violation, it is also generation together. They are making all of us. And if you want to mechanize, they are asking us to buy the machine. So they are giving a machine on loan to us. In the sense, they are giving the machine to the scavengers, thereby they have to buy the machine, pay the loan to the banker, and you take the machine and clean to them. So what is this? This is what is the actually modern untouchability, modern slavery. So you want to clean your municipality, the municipality must procure the machines instead of that they're asking them. So there are the many things, exploitations are there. So we do require international communities, solidarity and support, and all your support and uh, solidarity. One day we have to come out and say that there is no human being is cleaning human excreta and the self-respect and dignity and the rights are not violated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bejwara Wilson. You are a true activist uh, bringing the issue of thousands of uh, sanitary workers who probably India could be one of the very few countries 
where till date uh, manually uh, the toilets are being uh, cleaned without any uh, safety equipments and asking the sanitary workers to bear the cost of buying equipments is a definitely shameful and uh, india is supposed to be uh, talking about a uh, kind of a Swachh Bharat Abhiyan or the Clean India Mission, and this is definitely not what is reflected. And for WCC colleagues, uh, Bejwada Wilson hosted and spoke to the PTV, the Pilgrim Team Visits in 2019, and spoke to the members uh, in depth. Thank you very much, uh, Bejwada Wilson. Uh, friends, now uh, you continue to, I'm happy to see some questions coming up. Uh, let us continue to sending them in the chat. Now the next speaker, uh, many of you have already pointed out on the gender aspect of it, how it affects women and girls. And we have nobody better than uh, Reverend Nicholas Wood, uh, the program executive of WCC's uh, uh, program on women's concern. She is an ordained minister with the United Church of Jamaica uh, in the Cayman Island. And uh, as I mentioned, she's the program executive of WCC of uh, the program called Just uh, Community of Women and Men. And she's very passionate about gender justice and uh, liturgy. She has produced several uh, uh, documents, uh, to particularly to name one is the transforming masculinity. So over to you, Nikki, to bring in the gender perspective, the whole discourse in depth. Thank you so much, Dinesh. Good afternoon, everyone. A quick question for you. Have you ever had the serious urge to go? And when you wanted to, there was no place in sight or when you do get there, the convenience is such that it's better for you to keep it than to let it go. What if that were our daily experience? Toilets come in all shapes and sizes. And while there is a necessity about them, they are a necessary convenience. No one really wants to talk about toilets. But lack of access is a problem globally, whether it is among the rich or amongst the poor, for access to toilets can be an issue in many public spaces. For millions, actually billions, however, it is a private concern with public implications. According to the Thompson Reuters Foundation survey, more than 17 million women and girls in sub-Saharan Africa are obliged to fetch water daily because of poor or lack of sanitation at home in over 20 African countries. Three million girls, what 14 million women roughly, have been rising as early as 4 a.m. or are out on the streets until way after dark trying to get water for nourishment, but also for sanitary needs. We have heard the extent of the crisis in sanitation across the globe, but we have not always looked at what it means for those who have to go fetch water or secure means to get rid of their excreta after it has been done. Prof. Piri spoke about the fact that we're supposed to dig holes to put our excreta in. And while that may be beneficial in some ways to the soil, we do recognize that there is a health component when the water table is disturbed. But let us talk some more about what happens in particular to women when there is no facility for disposal of excreta. On the physiological aspect, it affects their menstrual health, their hygiene, their physical health in many ways. STGs, other infections, kidney damage, soft tissue damage on the brain in particular when they're having to carry the water on their heads and musculoskeletal damage from the impact of carrying these gallons and liters of water daily to and fro for miles. But there is also the sociocultural factors, my friends. Mental, emotional health being affected because the loss of dignity, despite Genesis 1 telling us that all humanity, male and female, are made in God's likeness and image. 
What is the message that we send to women and girls when even the basic need for public cleanliness and health and site hygiene matters are pushed under the carpet because we do not care? We consider the factor of excreta being a breeding ground for all sorts of diseases that nobody wants to discuss. And Brother Doug Finn mentioned this earlier. Then there is the issue of transportation of the water to make sanitation possible. The pots, the pails, the five gallon containers, and them doing these journeys on foot, putting them at risk to many other factors out there. We also think about the implication of extortion, where in some countries, especially for the public conveniences, you must pay someone, and I'm not talking the government officials now, though there are those who will then allow you access to the toilet, especially when you need to go. The WCC gender justice principles one to three, which are still under formation and, and, and subject to approval, insist that we need to encourage that the foundation of equality and justice stands against racism, sexism, ageism, economic inequalities, etc., on the principle of justice. Friends, if access to sanitation is unavailable to some, then it means there is a lack of justice for all. There is the issue of power sharing. Gender injustice as it relates to toilets and sanitation is a result of unequal power, as my colleagues have said. There is also the need to promote gender parity, even in relation to toilets, for far often women are found in long lines trying to make their way to toilets in public spaces, and the men have one or two to keep them going. Sometimes women have to take the risk and rush into the men's room before there is an embarrassing moment for them. Friends, as we consider this business of the gendered aspect of sanitation, I urge us to consider further the sociocultural and political impact and consider also how we might mitigate against this. Many times, for those who don't have sanitation conveniences at home, they are obliged to deal with the open spaces. They are at risk of rape, kidnapping, and other forms of social negative behavior by men and even women who prey upon their vulnerability and make life this, this difficult. We find that having to get up so early to fetch water, having to miss time at school to, 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 to get the water for the family and to make water available for flushing and other stuff means that girls in particular have less access to education and in some instances, zero access to education. That, as was said in the chat, has emotional and psychological implications because it already says to girls and to women, you are less than. We see the implications of high school dropouts or even elementary primary school dropouts when girls are subject to rape and diseases that come as a result of that, including SAIs, when they have no, no access and are obliged to go the far distances. So what then are we called to do? We've heard that we need to advocate. And I would argue, let us continue to advocate. Prof. Piri mentioned the biblical need to talk about these issues. Genesis 126 to 28 is where I started. God makes us all in God's image and likeness. In Ecclesiastes 1 7, we are told that there is need to speak about the issues related to sanitation and hygiene. Let's look at the Bible and see how we can argue the cases and bring it to light even in our sermons, our Bible studies, and our continued conversations. Join mission groups to install or provide toilets for those without, and advocate using the UN principles related to the human rights 
and the sustainable development goals to agitate that our political leaders, our church leaders, and anyone who believes in the rights for all will see to it that sanitation is available to everyone. Sanitation for none is equal to sanitation for none, no one. So if one person has no access to sanitation, we all are in trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nikki. As usual, very passionate about these uh, issues, uh, particularly related to gender justice. And uh, you brought in a very interesting dimension that gender justice is not something uh, different, but then the whole socio-cultural political uh, justice would then lead to gender justice because these are the factors which somehow uh, deprive uh, the, the, the women getting uh, gender justice. And, and thank you so much. I hope we will have some time left for uh, opening up discussions. There are so many questions coming up. Uh, the, the next uh, I'm giving a heads up is Michelle Roberts uh, already. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce her. Uh, Michelle Roberts is the national coordinator of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform. Uh, she's based in the US. Uh, she's the third generation Episcopalian who was one of the nine selected to represent uh, P.B. Michael Curry at the UNCSW, the Commission for Status of Women, the 63rd session. And uh, most importantly, we are very delighted, Michelle, that you currently serve as a member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council under the Biden administration. It's a matter of pride for us. Uh, as ecumenical organizations that you represent us at the Biden administration. She proclaims, uh, this is what you have <laughs> said, that your faith is what drives you, uh, your commitment to addressing systemic racism. So you would now bring in an interesting perspective of racism to sanitation. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you so very much. And I appreciate um, joining you this afternoon from Washington, DC. Um, and it's such a pleasure coming after Reverend Ashwood. Thank you. Um, I just want to continue on this theme of injustice and, and, and just remind folks across the globe that here in the United States, we do have the global south and the north. And what do I mean by that? There are communities, even in this major uh, co uh, country, America, where we say we have deep budgets and, and all of this technological advances, and yet there are still communities in the deep south who have no access to sanitary sewers. We have our tribal communities in as far up as Alaska and out into in New Mexico and other spaces with no access to sanitation um, sewage. We, in addition to that, on the heels of the climate crisis, where we have forced migration due to various storms, wildfires, and other things, we still have people seeking access to that of sanitation. And then to add insult to injury, when we do think about providing sanitation, um, sewage, if you will, we find that in the United States, the waste treatment plants are disproportionately impacted in communities of color and the poor thereby leaving them without, and sometimes some of these communities, while they may be neighbors to these facilities, such as in Texas, Sand Branch, Texas, to be exact, one of the, uh, and it uh, in Sam Branch, Texas, was actually one of one of our communities that we call the the Freedmen's Community that actually came out of slavery. Here, one of the world-renowned sewage treatment plants is located directly across the street from this community. However, the community is not 
factored into the plan, not tapped in. These are the things that we are impacted with in America. Let's even go even more so into the homelessness. Homelessness in America, where you have to relieve yourselves and there's no place to go because businesses, hotels, and other spaces, and yes, unfortunately, even our churches are locked up tighter than a drum. And as you say, that urgency to go, you cannot because there's nowhere for you to go. Nowhere. But the good news is the people and the people who remain united in a struggle and push for justice have pushed the halls of justice here in this country in many ways. And what do I mean by that? The environmental and climate justice movements who are pushing to make sure that these waste treatment plants are actually updated to a point that we make sure that communities are tapped in. And in addition to that, the hazards and the chemicals that they hold on in their facilities that could explode at any moment right next door to our communities are they take a precautionary approach to making sure that we stress for least toxic chemicals. In addition to that, to bring it to the church, the church that I'm affiliated with in Wilmington, Delaware, the Episcopal Church of Saints Andrew and Matthew, affectionately known as SAM, SSAM.org, believe it or not, created a bathroom ministry. The bathroom is so beautiful. And in the church updates, in the physical updates of the church, they made sure that this bathroom as well, that as soon as you enter the church hall, this bathroom is for actually the public. It's called the bathroom ministry. And the congregants and other members of the community make sure that this bathroom is staffed with all, and stacked, I should say, with all of the amenities that our women and girls and our, our, our folks on the streets need to make sure that they stay clean, safe, and healthy as best as possible. These are the things that we must be mindful of. In addition to that, our environmental justice movement, communities, and others saw to it that in real time, as we speak right now, before we even started this morning, the United States government has already proceeded to vote on the Build Back Better America Act. And what we are equally doing in that is that not, all, not everyone can build back better, so what do we do for them as well? These are the things that we must be able to push for. And this is why I'm so thankful to God that we have been able to even have a White House Council of Environmental Justice established. When we think about the men in power, white men in power, who have been in power for the history of this country, it will take, yes, men, but especially the white men in power right, to be able to push the power to change, to make a more just society for all of us. It will equally take all of us to be a part of that. And this is why we, I truly do believe, as we think about this Justice 40 here in America, this Build Back Better that we're speaking to in America, the fact that the church itself has in the Episcopal Church of, of Saints Andrew and Matthew have sought to take on systemic racism and the impacts thereof that impact our communities. How is it that we provide that beloved community and that more sacred space for all? I thank you for this opportunity. And I wanna stop here because I wanna really be able to make sure that we have 
the open space for us to be able to discuss this. This is a very important piece for me. And I just want to say last, the importance about the empowerment of girls, when you make sure that girls are strengthened and empowered, this young woman right here, not so young anymore. What some people don't know about me was not in my bio. I am a former environmental scientist that actually worked and tested in the sewage treatment facilities and plants and worked on these issues and saw in real time the impacts and the benefits. And this is why we are in a space today that we need to make sure that the funding from everything from foundations to that of the church, to that of governments are equitably and just distributed in such a way that no one should have to be uh, result, have, re, have, should have to result into cleaning excrement. That is unholy. That is unconscionable. That is ungodly. And I thank you so much for being part of this, of this wonderful panel. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that uh, challenge to the churches not to lock themselves up, but take a cue from the bathroom ministry and open up and provide spaces. This is a brilliant example and best wishes on the Build Back Better. Hopefully it would benefit the people of color when these infrastructures are put in place. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the conversation soon. And now friends, we have uh, the uh, video message from the president of the Ecumenical Water Network, Bishop Arnold Temple, uh, who is from Sierra Leone. And he's also the uh, president of All Africa Conference of Churches, the, the, the regional ecumenical organization of WCC for whole of Africa. Uh, so without too much uh, ado, I would now request uh, Marcelo to play the video for us please thank you of the world toilet day in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit we are reflecting here on a subject that we do not usually want to discuss toilet it is not something that features <clears throat> in our table discussions <clears throat> but today we reflect on it as we mark the World Toilet Day. Most people take sanitation, and particularly toilet, for granted. The facility is available to us, and we cannot imagine that people exist without such facility. When we build our luxurious houses, we make sure of several bathrooms and toilets. Sometimes with all the bedrooms self-contained, with individual bathroom and toilet, with a choice of bathtub and shower, some with jacuzzi berths and more. We use up more water than is necessary and fail to think of the majority of the people in our world that cannot afford the simple convenience of adequate or the minimum of water for necessary sanitation. You know, my friends, the movement of our bowels is a natural phenomenon. That's how God patterns our system. It gives us the opportunity to eliminate undigested food materials and related bacteria. Thus, it is important for the health of every human person. Many would find it difficult to believe that there are some communities without toilet in today's world. There are many who defecate in the open and many who can only do it in the cover of darkness at night so that they cannot be noticed and disgrace. 
they cannot face the embarrassment of open defecation, yet it is the only option open to them. Think of the inconvenience when people hold on to the need of easing themselves until it is dark enough. The communities there are whose only water sources are streams and rivers. They are faced with the danger of contamination of water. Somebody may have defecated upstream and that same water is collected by those who live downstream. And they are open to diseases such as diarrhea, cholera, etc. Thousands of children die every day as a result. Is it not blatant injustice that in our world today, people are allowed to go without the ability of emptying their stomachs? Sometimes, which is both natural and essential, yet they go without the ability to do that. Give a thought to young girls and women who are violated, assaulted, and raped while moving around looking for convenient places to defecate. World Toilet Day presents us with an opportunity to call for justice for our people in the fringe of society. In our various slums, the deprived and downtrodden, the marginalized, we are as church in a united way to offer a loud prophetic cry for the poor, marginalized and vulnerable people who are deprived of proper and dignified sanitation facilities. Let us stop paying lip service to sustainable development goal number six, the SDG six, which promises sanitation for all by the year 2030. Let us work towards its realization. My friends, it is an issue of justice. How can we contribute to the fullness of life that Christ promised in John chapter 10, verse 10? How can we claim to be Christians if we shut our eyes to the blatant injustice around us? Our worship falls short of what God demands if we do not address the issues of injustice in our midst. Remember what the Lord said through the prophet Amos. In the book of Amos chapter 8 verse 21, I read, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. In other words, though God appreciates our praise and worship, yet it prefers our standing up for justice. When we fail to stand up for justice, then our praise and our worship of God becomes meaningless. That's what we are called to as Christians. We are called to stand up for justice. May this World Toilet Day Bring us closer to God as we address the plights of his deprived people. I pray God's blessings on our united endeavor. God bless us all. Amen.
So uh, Bishop uh, Temple that was, he is currently chairing the executive committee meeting of All Africa Conference of Churches in Nairobi and therefore couldn't uh, join us. But we thank Bishop Temple for reminding us the, 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 the call for justice and the church's commitment towards uh, the sanitation, addressing the sanitation needs. Shalom, salam, peace, blessings to you all. In our morning prayer, there is there are those wonderful words, thanking God that He has formed us as a wonderful, the wonderful human body, which has openings that can open and close. When they do not function, we are not able to survive. It's a blessing that we say after we have been to the toilet. The notion that sanitation is so much part of the human existence and that it leads us to a healthy life is ingrained in Judaism and in fact in all spiritual traditions. It was for me a shock that when I started to work with so many of you to have water as a human right, that every human being has access to water, it was a, such a shock to see that toilets with running water were so scarce that so many people all around the world, but especially in places that uh, we neglect, are still not blessed with healthy sanitation. When that came part of my consciousness, we tried really to come together with Jiva, which we called Global Interfaith WASH Alliance. And in WASH, this health and sanitation and water as a connection. The dream was that in a few years, there would be change all over the world when all the spiritual traditions would work together because we are living in a magnificent time in which people from different spiritual traditions finally recognize that we desperately need each other to reach together the goal of justice and peace. And I'm so thankful to Puchi Swami and Satvi and others in Jiva, who in India have really reached remarkable success in accelerating the improvement of sanitation. I remember with the movement of my heart the moment that together we were able to inaugurate a block of toilets. It was a an holy moment. A blessed moment. Let me just summarize. We are at the gate of maybe the most important time in human and earth history. In the next 10 years, we have the chance to take the measures that are necessary to transcend national and personal borders and together to lay the foundations of a healthy earth with pure water and reach for everyone and sanitation. It is holy time. 
It's a holy decade. I hope in the deepest of my heart that we will be able to accelerate and to intensify this basic right to reach every human being with a healthy habitat with pure water and with a toilet we can rely on from day to day throughout our lives. Let us come together and achieve this dream. We will first take about three to four questions and go for one round and then open for another chance. But there are also some questions on the chat. I will review them. In the meantime, if any would like to, anyone would like to open the microphone and raise the question, please uh, feel free. Uh, I'm just reading uh, Surendra from, I think, uh, I'm not sure if he's from India, but he had raised a very basic question. Why sanitation is a taboo? <laughs> it's a very straightforward question, but uh, maybe uh, if someone uh, get going while we are raising others. Okay, Nikki, go ahead. So I know that in the Levitical laws of both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, each time anything related to sanitation, excreta, semen, bodily fluids, menstrual fluids is mentioned, it is given the sensitivity of that which is unclean, that which should not be seen or experienced. And when we find that, for example, if a man's semen is left on the outside, he is unclean for a day, and a woman's menstrual flow gives her uncleanness for a week, I think there's a sense in which one thinks, well, if the Bible says that you should cover it all up, then it means that we shouldn't just cover it underground, but we shouldn't speak about it. And therein has that myth evolved and become a major issue for many. We yeah. often figure that if we don't talk about problems in general, then it means that the problem doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So it's a cross between that biblical theological myth interpretation of texts and mm -hmm. the fact that we also are trying to pretend it doesn't exist. Okay, uh, there are more questions coming up. Uh, I think if Angelius Michael from uh, India, you are mentioning about uh, some experience of your church and also the country in the context of building toilets and yet they are rendered uh, useless. Would you like to raise the question? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's good to uh, hear from the speakers. Um, I Yes, I mean, from Indian context, even though India, the government of India has claimed the United Nations uh, want uh, access uh, to toilet for all the people in the world by 2030, but India has claimed already providing toilets to all its people in 2019 itself. But in, uh, on the ground, it is a different scenario. Uh, in many places, still, we do not have toilet. Uh, in 2012, we had an interesting visit to a village uh, together with uh, Dinesh Suna when he had just joined the WCC. And that was his first assignment, I believe, on one toilet day. Uh, to our surprise, in that village, we didn't find a single toilet a village of more than 200 families residing in that particular village. After nine years today, we when we look at that village, there are toilets constructed by the government, but of no use. In the sense, people do not use the toilets. They have converted those toilet buildings, very small ones, into their store rooms. It is probably because they do not find it comfortable, or it is, or, I mean, the water facility is not there. So only about 20 families are using that. My question is, since access to uh, water and uh, uh, toilets are based also on the uh, on poverty, 
So how international funding works to provide, you know, a clean toilets and access and uh, because it's about affordability of people. Mm. So how international funding works in this regard? Thank you, Michael. We will take a couple more questions. This one with the name I couldn't read, but is talking about examples of sawdust uh, toilets. Would you like to raise that question? Uh, uh, this is not your real name, I think. It's probably the mobile phone. I'm sorry, but my name is Chumi. Can you ah, OK, me? go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I just sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just remind my experience that when I went to travel kind of the countryside, I experience these kind of things, but I'm not very, very uh, careful because this is the another um, the problem with the tree. So that's why I'm not an expert, just the, the simple idea. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. And sorry about the confusion on the <laughs> names. Uh, friends, feel free to raise a question also by raising your hands um, while I'm reading some other questions that are, we, we have the, uh, yeah, Lauren, go ahead, please. Unmute yourself. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, here in, uh, in Kenya, it's already nighttime. Um, uh, my name is Lauren Odera. I, I, I work as a co coordinator for Geno Community Development Initiative. Um, which has been steered by the lady uh, Almut Feeling, who invited us to this uh, forum. Um, mm -hmm. I'm so pleased that uh, you know she has, uh, through her and economic uh, call world uh, vision, uh, we uh, we have gotten three uh, modern toilets uh, for schools. So, um, which even, uh, you know, parents say my, my, my son can go to that school because they are able, or my daughter can go to that school because they have a good toilet. So, uh, sanitation is very important. We also focus on HIV AIDS and water and sanitation. And uh, I mean, several churches have even approached us and mm -hmm. asked us, why are you building toilets only for uh, the schools. Mm -hmm. We also need toilets for uh, our churches because some people have, I mean, they, not all the churches uh, have access to good toilets. So uh, they, they've been asking us, we do not know what to do. And so maybe, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, uh, almost uh, feeling from the uh, um, Afrobeck World Group in Germany, uh, she, she's the one who has been um, conducting activities, fundraising to support this uh, construction of toilets uh, within uh, Kenya, in Western Kenya. So um, maybe whoever uh, can access the website, uh, uh, she yeah. can write the, her website, then you, we can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe get more support to also support churches. Thank you very much. Thank this you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and please write the website's name in the chat box. So uh, uh, any, anybody want to respond to Angelius Michaels? Uh, I mean, this is the reality that in India we have uh, toilets, but uh, more or less rendered useless and mostly the poor, uh, the, the linkage. Uh, Michael, can you just put in one sentence your question? Because we got a little mixed up. Okay, I probably said too many things. Uh, no, my, my first one was, uh, is, I mean, building toilet is one thing, but that, uh, that actually doesn't uh, fulfill uh, the promise uh, in the sense that the toilets are of no use. Uh, first, because uh, people do not know how to use it or the, the awareness is not there. And secondly, the toilets are always uh, without access to water. So our toilets are without flush, you know, so uh, there is no uh, access to water in many villages. So therefore the toilets are of no use. And secondly, I also want to know because uh, how the international uh, community work on the, uh, on, on funding to poorer countries uh, about uh, providing, you know, clean uh, and, and, uh, and safe toilet. 
I, I think I would ask the second part of the question for our Duffin to, to, to come Duffin to come because that's where you have been engaged uh, through NCA about the international community's support to address uh, sanitations in countries. Yes, um, I think uh, um, it's, uh, it's about advocacy uh, at the highest level and with national authorities and lo local authorities making this as one of the participants wrote in the chat uh, a basic right uh, it's a, a basic right to have access to food but to have access to water and sanitation is a part of that and and i want to say it things are not totally bleak you know mm. it's a huge challenge we've been addressing tonight or, or today uh, but moving uh, according to uh, the SDG report two years ago things were worse uh, we heard figures today 1.7 billion people still don't have access to a safe toilet 494 million still don't have a toilet at all the, the uh, figures two years ago was 2.2 billion and 673 million. So it works. Uh, so I think um, the, um, this, the, we just continually need to, to keep this on all different relevant agendas as we do and continue to prove that uh, we can really do the job, those of us who are uh, on the operational side of this. And um, I think it's extremely important that that churches raise their voices as well as do their part, as we have talked about today. Uh, because we see that uh, we should not underestimate uh, the power of the church uh, voice in this and the church actions in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, Michelle, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to quickly say um, we also need to be very mindful as we are talking about our climate um, plans. Um, it is very important that we develop climate plans that are devoid of what we are calling in this country false solutions. And those false solutions oftentimes wind up really taking as I put in the chat, we're finding more and more that in speaking to the brother's uh, uh, comment about the toilet without water, that water is being taken from small villages and other places by multinationals for some destructive practices. And at some points they are saying that it is for renewable projects, but they're really not so renewable. And then the country itself winds up or small village winds up with no water at all or contaminated water. So this is where we equally need the church to be mindful and where we used to have that robust uh, 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 collective work together, we are hoping, and at least I am hoping, um, that we can continue, continue to build this work together so that no one is left behind and we make sure that we don't place more harm that is unnecessary on our people. I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, we, we have a very long, uh, uh, so many questions in, chat, in the chat have come. Um, I would request uh, Cecilia to just briefly uh, uh, point your question uh, if you are still around, because uh, you wrote quite a bit and uh, we are probably running out of time. Over to you, Cecilia, take the floor. Sorry, uh, my English is not very good because I. It's okay. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's terrible. I, I, I take for you and for you to read the comment, please.
in uh, okay, access to Chile. water yes so, you, sorry access to toilet leads to the problem of the access to water exactly and unavoidable theme in the two counter summits was a water problem and the water crisis facing chile it is a conflict mm -hmm. where for experts and environmentalists drought and the looting of this vital resource intersect the seriousness of the problem would be the result not only of the lack of rainfall due to climate change but also of the legislation that has privatized Chile's water. Mm. Civil society mobilizes every day and churches join with modest effort. Mm. And the question is directed at us, yourself, myself, and Prof particularly. What are the ways that we can influence international alliances such as churches linked to the World mm. Council of Churches? So operatively, yeah. it would be our question, Excellent. but more so the other panelists with us. Yeah, yeah. And anyone? Michelle, are you, are you trying to say? Uh, um, obvious linkage between water, I mean, lack of water also leads to lack of sanitation facilities. That is a general knowledge now, but uh, Chile's water also been privatized and that's another um, uh, huge issues which we need to deal with. Uh, anybody want to take a, a stab at it? I was just excited about this because this is the direction we need to go in. It, it cannot be a siloed approach. It must be a holistic conversation in order for us to really fulfill the mandate of the SDG 6. And, and the sister from Chile was spot on. Your English was spot on with that. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say that unless we have that conversation, especially in the intrafaith community, then we'll, we're just spinning our wheels because mm -hmm. that is, it's more, it's happening more and more. And so, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. I would want to argue that this may be the beginning of the conversation or the middle of the conversation since our ecumenical water network has been addressing some of these issues. But when we bear in mind campaigns such as the one showing on my Zoom screen, Thursdays mm -hmm. in Black, there is opportunity for us to explore some of these issues when we raise the volume each Thursday when we are posting to, 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 to um, social media. I would want to argue, as is being said by several others, that there are other pieces of the puzzle for us to consider, is for us to reach out to the World Council of mm. Churches. We will not necessarily be able to provide financial support, mm. but what we can offer, whether through our churches, Commission on International Commission of Churches and International Affairs, our Ecumenical Water Network, Just Community of Women and Men, Human Rights, <laughs> agencies, mm. we can provide some of the advocacy, accompaniment, solidarity, and raising of the volume mm. that can come from a global fellowship, such as the World Council of Churches. We also would propose that, for example, during the 16 days, which is less than a week away, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these are some of the issues, now that we've been made aware of the facts, that we can use as talk points yeah. as we lift the issues during the 16 days. Just one way to go forward. And I'm sure that people like Dagfa, with his work with mm -hmm. promoting toiletry, et cetera, would be open to having some of the conversations to see how we can go forward. Excellent. Excellent. Nicole, I think you have given your last word that I wanted to ask each of the panelists. And now I would ask uh, others your 30 seconds uh, last take. Uh, we'll go to Michelle. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say together we win and together we make sure that no one is left behind. That's all I have to say to Thank God. You. The Lord. Thank you. Doug Finn, what's your last word? 30 seconds. Well, I come back to uh, to the side of the, the topic that I, I touched upon in my uh, first intervention that uh, no girl should feel ashamed because of her period. And all women and girls should be able to manage the menstruation with dignity. Thank you. Bezwana Wilson, if you are there, what is your last word, the last uh, message? No, we, we have to take the whatever we have taken now, discussion, 
to the logical end because there are the many things we have discussed. It is not just one area. It is a toilets, it is in a ministerial health, and it is a, again the people who are cleaning. Hmm. So it is in a, a, a service providers, their dignity, and the people who need the service of the sanitation. Together, we have to complete that sanitation chain. Hmm. So we should not miss service providers or the people who receive the service or the governments or the civil society or the solidarity. Thank you. And Thank you. One exactly. We would not stop at this webinar. There will be follow up to take these things forward. Over to you, Isabel. What's your last message? Yeah. Our conversation about toilets should not be limited to the World Day on toilets. Mm -hmm. You know, this should be included in our theological curriculum, uh, raising awareness with our churches and indeed with, in our advocacy you know, with the governments, you know, for more funding, you know, to build toilets or public toilets. So let's not limit this conversation to today. It's part of our lives and it should be a continuous conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. That's also coming from the WCC leadership level. So we are very much looking forward to, to continuing the discussion. So friends, thank you very much to each one of you. And uh, as we, uh, because you attended and participated, we want to thank you, but we want to leave all of you with uh, uh, the, the Isabel mentioned about the hymn uh, based on toilets that was written by Carolyn Gillette and uh, beautifully sang by Terry MacArthur. Uh, with that, we would end it in just three more minutes. Please stay with us. Thank you. God of love, we take for granted common places that we use. We have bathrooms, we have washrooms, we have restrooms, we have news. We may smile at what we're singing, but we would not want to be left without these common places that bring health and dignity. Countless women suffer violence going outside in the night to avoid humiliation that they feel when it is love, countless children leave their houses, facing trouble, feeling fear, for their homes still lack the toilets that we take for granted here. There are girls who, as they're growing, put their books and school aside. They can't care for changing bodies, so they stay at home and hide. There are precious little children who will die this very day. For there's no good sanitation where they live and learn and play. God am I, my brother's keeper, is my sister in my care. Does my neighbor's problem matter? 
Oh.